We're good? Okay. Do you want to It's not going to play. It's not going to play. I have to do it inside here, and then I'm going to. I'd just like to thank uh, Monique again for inviting uh, me here and for organizing this really interesting series this year so far. It's been excellent and, and I hope that we can live up to the last uh, talk and the excitement that Carrie generated around her research. So uh, today uh, I wanted to stress I guess at the outset that this, this is a presentation of a paper, not necessarily a presentation of an entire research project. So we've been working in Cameroon for, uh, for about, uh, Lauren and I, who's sitting over there, uh, for about four years now, since 2010, on different topics. Uh, and this one uh, that, that Alexander and I are here today to talk about is, is a, an extension of that, that field research. So I, I was thinking, why are we talking about perspectives uh, last night? And I thought, I looked at my calendar and I said, it was about 10 years ago. Uh, I was finishing my master's uh, in Toronto and my advisor said, you know, here's, here's some tickets to go to the Glen Gold studio at you know, CBC Studios. So I went down there and said, well, what's happening at the CBC Studios? Well, it was Jagdish Bagwadi. And Jagdish Bagwadi is, is a trade economist noted for his views on, on free trade. And, and he got up there and proclaimed himself to be the world's number one free trader. And he also continued to, to criticize, uh, in that context, uh, Joseph Stiglitz uh, for his advocacy on, on behalf of the downtrodden and the marginalized in the context of globalization. And, and I realized, I think, at that point that perspectives really do matter. When you might be a, you know, a social scientist with a rigorous quantitative skill set on the one hand, on the other hand, you might also be advocating a, particularly, uh, you know, a particular point of view. And in that instance with Bagwadi drew my attention more to, uh, to issues of perspective. We're going to have to keep this screen like this just for a second because the videos are too big to open. Um, I'll pull them out of the program then we can actually watch the full screen slideshow. So what am I talking about? We say uh, here CMAC. Uh, the, the community, the economic and monetary community of, of Central Africa. So what is it? Well, um, it's, it's basically uh, Central African Republic, Chad, Cameroon, Equatorial Guinea, uh, Gabon, and I've, I've forgotten one here, uh, Congo Brazzaville. So the Republic of Congo also goes by the name of Congo Brazzaville in the literature. So if someone says, well, what is Central Africa? Why aren't you talking about the DRC? Well, there's, there's a reason for that, because there's an economic community of, of Central African states of which the, the DRC is a part. But the, the Democratic Republic of Congo, Burundi, they don't share the same currency as CMAQ. So the Central African Economic and Monetary Community uh, has, has a common currency, the, the CEFA, the uh, uh, Central African franc, and uh, that's managed by the Bank of Central African States. So we said, let's talk about CMAQ. So that just gives you a sense of, of what it looks like in terms of a region, a swath up from the Gulf of Guinea. But then we've also got um, kind of some specific areas. So this little green dot here is the jaw, and I'm going to take you there uh, right now. This is uh, a picture. Well, I guess I can just play it. Hopefully, we can play. Yeah, there we go. Maybe not. Okay, perfect. It's the best I can do in terms of size. This is the president's village. The president of Cameroon wanted to have a small scale uh, rubber project uh, to support um, the villagers of, of his home village a few years back. So uh, uh, the rubber company uh, in Cameroon, uh, a company that was called Heavycam, uh, was bought by a Singapore listed firm called GMG Global which is now controlled by something called Sinochem. Sinochem is China Chemical. China Chemical is the majority shareholder in this operation in the President's Village. This is going to be a 55,000 hectare rubber plantation in the President's Village. The initial idea had been to uh, make it a smallholder uh, rubber operation, which would have uh, enabled smallholders to cultivate food at the same time as rubber. But here we have uh, basically primary uh, tropical rainforest uh, going down for these rubber plants that were just put in the ground. This is uh, December last year when we were invited as guests to, to view this, uh, this plantation. 
And in uh, development, I think there were maybe a thousand hectares that had already gone down as of uh, the end of November last year when we, when we visited. And we hope to, to get the invitation to go back this year. Um, although uh, we were told, you know, try not to, to put this out in the, in the media, we might have problems getting back in, into the country. Um, the interesting uh, point here is that they're trying to cultivate rubber and rice together. You can't really see it uh, in this particular <coughs> shot, but uh, the, the idea is that while the rubber is growing up, you might get a little bit of rice. And I just wanted to give you some sort of visual representation of what we're on about today. So hopefully, if I can yank these slides out of here, we will actually be able to open the slideshow because they're just too big. Okay, well, we'll just go with this if that suits everybody else, because you can see it. Um, so what, why are we here? Why am I talking about sumac? Well, part of it relates to uh, my doctoral uh, research on cotton in Africa. I had thought that I was going to go to Cameroon, which has a very uh, strong cotton economy in the north. I was uh, concurrently with my, my PhD uh, working with the North-South Institute in Ottawa. They do development research and uh, an economist from Cameroon was based in Ottawa when I was there. Uh, his name was Sunday Khan and Sunday said, come to Cameroon, there's some really interesting things happening in the cotton sector. Well, in 2013, it actually turns out that I probably should have gone to Cameroon to talk about uh, or to learn about the cotton sector. Uh, the head of the uh, National Cotton Association, the company that buys and all the cotton in the country, provides all the inputs, uh, he's now in jail. And he also was, at the same time as being the head of the, uh, the cotton company, uh, the head of the National Football Federation. And I'm sure Alexander can tell you a little bit about uh, the, the linkages between football, cotton, and corruption in, uh, in Cameroon. So I resolved to go to Cameroon. We went and conducted some research on the uh, Forest Stewardship Council certification of forests there, uh, produced some papers on timber, uh, comparing it with cotton. And then uh, last year in 2012, uh, proceeded to go back to Cameroon on a couple of occasions to take a look at food security and the issue of perspectives. So this paper today comes out of, uh, of, a, of a growing interest in, in food security uh, in, in that particular region due to the, I guess you could say, the scaled up interest of lots of, of different actors in the region's food economy. So China, Russia, India, Brazil. Indian tractors are all over the place in Central Africa and Cameroon right now. Um, lots of Russian inputs, fertilizer and chemicals from Russia. Lots of Chinese engagement, in, in, as I just showed, um, on the, uh, you know, the president's village, Sinochem. But also through trade, Chinese rice, Vietnamese rice. So there's a lot of new interest in the, in the food economy in Cameroon by, by new players in, in, in the global economy, by the BRIC economies, you could call them, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and others. So we were trying to figure out what the impacts, what, what are local perspectives on the impacts of, of these kinds of uh, global actors on food in Cameroon last year. And building from that project, um, while, while Lauren and I were there last December, we kept hearing from people, the Gabonese, they're coming across the border into Cameroon. They're buying all of our plantains. We can't get access to plantains. We don't want to eat the Chinese rice all the time. We want to actually eat our, our traditional cultural foods. Uh, why are they able to buy up all our plantains? Why can't we afford them anymore? So our direct experience in that you know, context essentially enabled us to say, well, let's, let's take a look at, at CMAC as a region because it's increasingly being drawn together, the economies of Gabon, Cameroon, Congo, Brazzaville, Chad, Central African Republic, and to a lesser extent, Equatorial Guinea. So that's the why. I think there's increasing food attention to the region, and there's also an increasingly uh, uh, regional economy on food. So the, the heavy lifting for this, and, and this is why I, I really feel that I shouldn't be so front and center in this. I mean, the major heavy lifting uh, was done uh, by a team of people over the last summer. So uh, luckily, uh, Alexander Leguego knows what he's doing with data analysis software because I had never used any sort of data analysis software. I'd always coded my own data from interviews. This is the first attempt uh, that I had ever made uh, with this particular paper we're presenting today to actually, um, well, what is this thing called hyper-research? Maybe you can tell us when we talk about methodology. But uh, um, I'd never previously worked with this kind of thing, but it seemed like a good fit. I also was really particularly lucky um, to have had a student approach me uh, at the end of, of April, last year, Angela Sweeney, who's here right there in the blue. And Angela is one of the University of Gulf's president's uh, scholars, presidential scholars, and she was a presidential research assistant last summer. And, and I believe you coded upwards of a thousand documents for this particular paper. So that was a, a huge, huge load of work. And uh, another undergraduate student at the university who's, I, 
not here right now, I don't think, and my glasses aren't on, but uh, Tekla Van Bussel is currently the co-chair of WASC on campus, and uh, she also made significant contributions to the data analysis. So we had a bunch of people uh, working together last summer here in Guelph when we were not uh, traveling around Cameroon or Central Africa to talk about this, uh, this topic. We talked about it here and, and, and made our way through last summer. So um, the research support network in Cameroon that's been really helpful for us over the years that C4, that's the Center for International Forestry Research. So they've been uh, essentially the contacts and a lot of the documents and the data that we were able to, to gather for this particular paper um, are a direct result of the contacts we made through the Center for International Forestry Research in Yaoundé. And, uh, and we also had some support from CG over in Waterloo and, and from Shirk in the case of, of Lauren. So I think what I, what I want to do then is just kind of uh, give you a sense of the research question and then turn things over to, to Alexander to talk about why we're asking this question, like the so what for the study and, and then to get into the methodological considerations. So the banana plantain example is essentially one rationale for studying uh, these countries as group. And, and I would argue that there are a couple more rationales for studying these, these countries as a group. That even though there's a, a bunch of different challenges within them. And, and here's what I mean by this. Um, food aid deliveries are very different. If you go to Chad, the Sahel Band, if we go back to our, our map here, um, you know, up, up here, and I think you can actually see it, you know, you've, got, you've got a lot of, of potential food security issues in terms of availability. So you know, drought prone areas or flooding. And, and down here, I'd, I'd say the food security issues can sometimes be a little bit different relating to the adequacy of diets or, or food pricing. So, so there's different challenges uh, across the region. The kilocalories that are available per day, they differ. Um, Congolese and Gabonese, uh, you know, many more Congolese, for example, if we look at, at Congo Brazzaville, fall below the national poverty line um, than people in Gabon. It's, I think the number is, uh, it's about, four, I believe it's one in 14 in Gabon and maybe, maybe one in three in Congo Brazzaville fall below the national poverty line. So there's some really interesting di differences uh, across Central Africa. Uh, but, and of course you've got this kind of con you know, current conflict ongoing in Central African Republic. Um, you've got post-conflict status here. There was, a, you know, there was a war at the same time the DRC fell into, into conflict in the 1990s in, in Brazzaville. And you've got countries that have been fairly stable even though Boko Haram is operating out of, out of here in northern Cameroon and that's causing some instability next door in Nigeria. So I mean there's lots of differences. But I, I would argue there's also a lot of similarities and this makes it useful uh, for, for using them together. The first is that if we go back to the map, oil and gas, I mean the extractive sector is just, you know, it's, it's massive and you've got the Chad Cameroon oil pipeline here. You've got a, a project, one of the first of its kind in the world, directly on the border of Brazzaville and Cameroon. This is the Umboam oil project controlled by Sundance Resources. They're constructing a railroad uh, right here to the port at Kribi, which is where the terminus of the Chad Cameroon oil pipeline is. And Gabon is also thinking about putting some uh, some resources through there as well, including uh, another train line here from Brazzaville that would hook up with the Gabonese train line and all that's going to go out here at this port called Kribi, which used to have nice beaches. So, I mean, there's lots of things drawing the region together, uh, not the least of which is CMAC, which is the uh, Commission uh, for the, the Central African Economic and Monetary Community. It's based in Bangui in the Central African Republic, and that is you know, driving um, regional trade integration and the reduction of, of, of tariff barriers on food. So it's, it's essentially becoming one regional food economy and governments have given up the policy tools that they could uh, used to have at their disposal to control food in, inflows into and out of uh, the country across regional borders. So I say, you know, it's, it's good to study it together. That's why we're, we're trying to do it. And what are, what are we asking here? Well, <laughs> essentially what we're asking is, uh, um, you know, in what ways, if any, are perspectives on food security in CMAC amongst stakeholder groups similar or different? I mean, that's the ultimate question here. What, in what ways do identifiable stakeholders uh, take similar lines on food security challenges and in what ways do they take different lines? And, and here, why are we, another reason why we're talking about perspectives, this is the National Statistics Agency. It's dark in this image. It's, uh, it's a two-story building. And uh, so unfortunately, that's not really coming through so well. But if you want to check it out, come on up and, and look at my computer a little later. There's not a lot of, uh, of activity there. So maybe Alexander can, can help us with the, uh, the so what's and I'll switch the mic over to. Yeah. 